All right, welcome to those that are here at Faith Family Chapel and those that are online. We are here every day on Sunday at 10 a.m. We're still in the book of Timothy, 2 Timothy, Paul's writing. We're going to open this morning with a scripture that says in Jeremiah 14, Then the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own minds. The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. Father, we thank you for the words that you left behind. We ask that our hearts and ears are open this morning as we listen to them. In Jesus' name, amen. God is speaking directly to Israel because at that time, a lot of false prophets and false teachers and so forth were showing up on the scene. So this is nothing new. And he basically tells Israel, listen, they're, they're telling you lies. I didn't send them. I didn't appoint them. Uh, and they're prophesying to you false vision, divinations, idolatries, and delusions of their own mind. It's an example. It's a picture of what we would anticipate a modern-day false teacher to give us, that type of, of a persona where they're giving us false vision, divinations, idolatries, and delusions. And how do we know they're false? Well, we compare them to what the Bible says. We always compare what the Bible says. If we're going to basically um, test the spirit, we can only test the spirit against what the Bible says. I can't test it against what I think, what my intellect says, what's logical, what I feel. None of that is real. Only the word of God is capable of telling you whether something is real or not. And so... Paul's talking to Timothy where we left off. He said, in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who judge the living and the dead, and in the view of, the, of his appearing and in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So again, he's saying to Timothy, use the word for all of your Walk and ministry. Make sure you're using the word to do these things, not your own intellect, not your own feelings, not what you believe. It's not an experience. Just go to the word of God and God will deal with the issue. And he goes on. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. So this is what's going to happen in the future. In the future, people will not put up with the sound doctrine. They're not going to put up with what the Bible says. They're not going to put up with what the Word of God says. Instead, to suit their own desires, they're going to gather around them a great number of teachers to say what they want to hear. That's why when you go down south, there's a church on every single street, five, six, seven in a row, each one teaching something the people in those seats want to hear. That's why they go there and not somewhere else. He goes on and says, they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. And that's what's been happening in the modern church for quite a while. So let's look at those things that are causing, what are those things people's itchy ears want to hear? Well, this was all over the news uh, last couple weeks. Uh, you'll see that the United Methodists down there in the middle uh, they basically changed their bylaws and removed the Word of God from their bylaws. Originally, the Word of God that they had in their bylaws stated no homosexual could be married, could be in a position of leadership in the church. Homosexuality was an abomination and a sin. And it's been the, it's been the model of the United Methodists for about 50 years. A couple weeks back, they had a meeting and they basically took that out. And now they're allowed to have homosexual marriages, same-sex marriages, transgender marriages. Those individuals can now lead in the church. They can be pastors. They can be ordained. And they are now in the church. Now, the United Methodist Church was the largest Protestant church in the United States, the largest church in the United States. 25% of their congregation left over the last three or four years because they knew this was brewing. They knew this was coming in. People were trying to get them to change, and so they lost 25%. But now they've gone full-out rainbow, full-out rainbow. And they're not alone, right? Up in the corner over here, the two ladies there, 
that you know they support marriage for everyone. They're basically the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church was the first to adopt it in the United States. They adopted this back in uh, 2012. So they've been pushing their uh, resolution that's, that uh, same-sex gender and neutral marriages ceremonies were acceptable and clergy were allowed to live in that lifestyle. And then you have the Pope, who we talked about uh, last December. He got online and basically said that, you know, we're going to allow in the Christian church, Catholic priests can now bless same-sex unions. They can now bless that. This is what's going on in the church. Remember Paul talked about there'll be a great apostasy before the end comes. A great apostasy where people will turn away from the truth. You can't turn further away from the truth than this. You can't turn away from this. In Mark 10, it says, however, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. He made two separate people or persons, whatever you want to describe them. Well, why? We learn in Genesis 2. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for out of man she was taken. Now listen, why was woman created? Listen, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Why was woman created? So that a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and become one flesh flesh. The whole purpose of creating a man and a woman in God's world, in God's kingdom, was for man to have a helper and for him to be able to procreate with his wife, become one flesh. Many of you may have heard about the um, Kansas City Chiefs kicker that was all in the news earlier in the week. He's a staunch Catholic. He got up in a Catholic university. They asked him to give a benediction or whatever kind of message that he gave, and he basically got up and told them that it would be a really, you know, that many of the women might be looking forward to becoming uh, housewives and mothers and raising children in the home, which is the greatest thing you could do in the kingdom of God. And he's getting crucified for that. Now, this is a Catholic, in a Catholic environment, talking to presumably Catholic children. That is kind of the message in the Catholic environment. In the Catholic environment, they don't even want you to use condoms. They want you to basically procreate and create as many little Catholics as humanly possible. And he's getting crucified for stepping up and speaking what he believes in the Word of God. Many of them were using this scripture because there were a lot of the, the Methodist priests and pastors who were being challenged. Why do you think this is okay? Why do you think this is not lining up, you know, that this lines up with the Word of God. Because in the Word of God in Leviticus 20, God clearly says, if a man lies with a man, as with a woman, they have both committed an abomination, they must surely be put to death. Now, there was this 19, 1946, I think it's the, this 1946 commission that went out, and they were looking at the, at the Bible, and they put together this, you know, video montage about the word homosexuality never existed in the Bible ever until it was translated into homosexuality. But that's not what it said. It, you know, it was like, oh, it was perverse actions and it was this and that and the other thing. And the reality is, if I read Leviticus to you, is the word homosexual used at all? No, it's not used once. It basically says, if this action happens, it's an abomination, and they deserve to be killed. So the enemy is trying like crazy to continue to manipulate the word of God to make it sound like we're the ones that are wrong. We're the ones that have it incorrect. God clearly said, if a man lies with a, with a man as he did with a woman, that's an abomination and must surely be put to death. There is no, there's no get out of jail for free card. Same sex relationships are not allowed in the kingdom of God, period. You can't, you can't take that out of the Bible. It's repeated again by Christ when he talks about why a man and a woman are to come together in marriage. It's repeated again by Paul several times, okay? You can't miss this. 
So what are they using to justify themselves? Well, Romans 8. Therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So if there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus and they're practicing homosexual, it's okay. As a matter of fact, if you listen to them, several, I listened to several of their pastor types talk, they actually, what they said was there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. They left out to those that are in Christ Jesus. See, in order to be in Christ Jesus, we started this with breaking the bread. In order to be in Christ Jesus, you have to do what? You have to obey his commands. You can't be in Christ Jesus if you do not obey his commands. So if I obey his commands and he says homosexuality, same-sex relationships, whatever, is not good, and I say it is good, well, the logic is and you're just not in Christ. You're in somebody, but it's not Christ. You're in the father of lies who's telling you it's okay. See, this is an easy thing to deal with. This is very logical. It's not difficult to understand, yet now we have three major so-called Christian denominations in the world promoting this as okay. So the end is near. The great apostasies happen. People will not put up with sound doctrine. What's the next thing we've seen? Well, we've already talked many, many times about these so-called um, prosperity preaching guys, the guys out there telling you that you should have live your best life, you should be rich, you should be healthy, you should be wealthy, blah, 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 blah. Right? That's been going on for quite a while. That's not new. This has been going on in the United States at least since the 40s and 50s in a major way. The guy on the left over here, Joel Olstein, says, God wants us to prosper financially, to have plenty of money to fulfill the destiny he has laid out for us. This is what he's teaching his congregations. He has the largest congregation in Texas. They get 30,000, 40,000 people. A Sunday. God wants to prosper us financially, to have plenty of money to fulfill the destiny he has let out for us. Now, we've been reading the Bible word for word for word. Did you catch that? Did I miss that scripture? Did I cut that out of my Bible where God said, yeah, I want to prosper you so that you can... Not a, no. A, no. No. How could he miss this? I think he's very sincere about what he's saying. How does he miss this? Then you have Benny Hinn, who's in the news all the time because he's constantly repenting. He, was, he apparently went on a podcast a couple weeks back and said, I'm repenting again. Uh, he's constantly in repentance. But this is what he taught. Poverty comes from hell. Poverty comes from hell. Didn't Jesus say the poor will always be among us? Didn't Paul say we're supposed to take care of those in need? Isn't that the message? If it's from hell, why wouldn't he just say, no, they're supposed to be rich, and they're from hell, so we don't deal with them at all. They belong to the father of lies. This is, people eat this up. The guy in the middle, Kenneth Copeland, is by far the largest um, guy in the mess. He's, he's the one that started most of this stuff. He wrote a book. It says, the blessing of the Lord makes rich and uh, and I can't read the rest. And there's no sorrow with it, okay? In his forward of his book, this is what he writes in his book, in the forward. It says, the blessing of the Lord is God's original plan for you. Contrary to popular belief, he doesn't want you sick, broke, and lonely. He wants to make you rich in every area of your life, your health, your finances, your relationships, and more. That's the forward of his book. God doesn't want you to be broke or sick or lonely. He wants to make you rich in every area of your life. Health, finances, and relationships. And people ate that up with a knife and a fork to the tune of, this guy's worth over a billion dollars now. Over a billion dollars that people gave to him because he was telling them this message. And then the guy in the bottom, you're going to start hearing more and more about him coming out. That's T.D. Jakes. Um, 
T.D. Jakes has, has been in uh, trouble lately. Um, he, he's been uh, accused of sexual infidelity. He's been accused of <coughs> uh, financial impropriety. In, in one of his uh, latest lessons, because I saw it, I saw him say it, he says, I don't care how poor you are, you can still tithe. He was on a tithing message and basically telling people, it doesn't matter how poor you are, you can still tithe. You've got a credit card. You've got people you can borrow from. Don't steal from God. This is crazy. But not for him, because he's worth $150 million preaching the gospel. $150 million. Joel Osteen's worth at least $40 million, and Benny Hinn's $42 million. Listen, the word is clear about these kind of guys. It says in 1 John 2, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Love not the world. I have a nice house, but I don't think anybody's going to accuse me that it's a mansion, that it's well beyond my needs, that I have, what, I have things that you know, are not reasonable for someone in my position. These guys are living in multi-million dollar mansions with, you know, tons of, of perks, like multiple jets, multiple high-end cars, clothing up the gazoo, jewelry, uh, fine dining, going out, whatever, whatever, whatever. And everybody thinks it's okay because they tell them it's okay. It's not okay. Didn't Paul say that I, I didn't ask for anything from you because I didn't want to tarnish the gospel? I worked as a tent maker. Even though I could have asked you to help me, I didn't so that I wouldn't tarnish the gospel of Christ. That's all they're doing here is tarnishing the gospel of Christ. Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Don't store the treasure up on earth, because when you die, you're not taking it with you. Use it for the kingdom of God. Use it wisely. And finally, in 1 Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Did you hear the word? Godliness with contentment. Be happy with what God provided you. Don't get caught in the bigger, better, more syndrome. And that's what these guys are constantly saying. You should have bigger, better, more. And if, excuse me, if you don't, you don't have enough faith. And if you don't believe that, you're just listening to the enemy. That doesn't jive. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires and plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This has been going on in the, in the church now for decades. And we allow it to continue. My hope was these guys would die off and it would go away. No, <laughs> they're, they're being replaced by their sons and their daughters and new converts that are preaching the same message. It's not going away. People will not put up with sound doctrine. Another big, a big issue within the modern church is female pastors, female leadership in the church. There was a major schism within the, the uh, Baptist community uh, last summer when they had whatever that meeting was uh, because the guy from Saddleback was pushing really hard to basically let... Uh, uh, female uh, women be pastors in the in the Baptist churches. Uh, he was shot down, and so he left the church. He broke away from the Southern Baptist community because of that. This is pretty straightforward stuff, right? You got Paula White. You may have seen her, the one up on the right. Uh, Tammy Faye Baker was an early adopter. We saw that. She had the big eyelashes, right? Um, the other one, Joyce Meyer. Everybody, everybody swears by Joyce Meyer. Everybody swears by Joyce Meyer. And basically Juanita Bynum. Uh, she's a very popular individual as well. 
Uh, many of the prominent churches still do not ordain women, right? The Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, and the Southern Baptist Church will not ordain women. It's very simply why. What do we say when we're trying to test the spirit? We go to the Bible. Well, what does the Bible actually say? Simple stuff. First Timothy 2. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. The Word of God says, I don't allow a woman to have authority over a man, and she must be quiet. In 1 Corinthians 14, For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints, meaning all churches are going to respond the same way. Women are to be silent in the churches. They are not permitted to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. The majority of the churches that are allowing women to basically be in a role of leadership are quoting Galatians 3. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are... Uh, what's that word? Oh, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. They're using this because... Paul is saying, well, we're all one in Christ, therefore, if we're all one in Christ, how could we not allow women to participate in leadership? Well, because we're all one in Christ means we all get salvation. It's a simple message. This isn't that difficult. We all get it the same, but there's an architecture. Just like Jesus said, I'm not the Father, I'm the Son. Even though I am God, I'm still the Son. There's an architecture. We live in an architecture. It's just the way God set it up. It shouldn't be even a question. And people that understand their Bible would be like, what are you talking about? This is not that difficult, guys. The United Church of Christ started this in 1853 um, with the first uh, female pastor. Then you had the Assemblies of God in 1914. The Methodists let them in in 1956. The Presbyterians in 1956. Lutherans in 1970. And the Episcopal Church in 1976. So every major denomination that calls himself Christian with the exception of the three we talked about, they've been letting women into positions of leadership. And as we spoke to here before, this has nothing to do with the quality of a woman. This has nothing to do with their ability. This has nothing to do with their intellect. This has nothing to do with whether or not they can do the job. It has to do with God says, that's not how I want it arranged. Period. That's all. That's how I want it arranged. People will not put up with sound doctrine. This one killed me. So there are, if you look online for what um, uh, academies of supernatural teaching or schools of supernatural teaching or any of that and put it in Google, you will literally come with hundreds of locations that have set up teaching environments to teach you how to deploy supernatural power in the kingdom of God. Hundreds. I was shocked how many. I knew there were some out there, but hundreds. The leader in this is Bethel's, Bethel Church. Bethel has the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. Uh, they're going to basically teach you everything normally that we talk about. They're going to teach you how to speak in tongues. They're going to teach you how to interpret tongues. They're going to teach you how to prophesy. They're going to teach you how to heal people. But then they're also, they've added some funky stuff. They have this thing called the fire tunnel, where people put their hands and make a tunnel, and you run through it, and the Holy Spirit empowers power to you as you're running through this, this tunnel. They have this thing called the Holy Ghost headbutt. You laugh. No joke. The Holy Ghost headbutt. That you and whoever, you'll sit and pray and be involved, and he'll be like, you ready for the Holy Ghost? Head bob? Boom! <laughs> You've been empowered with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and they eat it up with a knife and a fork. Knife and a fork. Okay? Um, they have this other thing they call grave soaking. Grave soaking. Where if I want to get, po if I want to get more power supernaturally, I'm going to go to an individual's grave who is a very powerful spiritual person, and I'm going to lay on their grave, and then I'm soaking up all their supernatural power into my body. Mm -hmm. like, like when the Aborigines would basically eat a portion of the heart of an enemy because they wanted to gather their power. It's all pagan. This is not, this is not good stuff. 
Okay? On top of stuff that happens regularly in their <coughs> services, where they have this thing called the glory cloud. The glory cloud appears above everyone and rains down gold and the stuff that is supposed to be mana. When in reality, it's just gold flakes that they put up there and some paper and they blow it into smoke. But everybody goes crazy for it. Everybody goes crazy for it. This is what's happening. And I put up there, uh, if you want to attend this, and this is right, 2025, 2024, 25. If you want to attend this school to learn all of that, it'll only cost you $5,750. So for $5,750, you can learn all of these things. And I would like to tell you that there's only a few people that participate. No, it's sold out. <laughs> sold out. Okay? Sold out. Uh, the Cincinnati School of Supernatural Ministry, uh, that, that's also online. That's from the Vineyard Group. So Vineyard has that as well. Uh, the Global School of Supernatural Ministry, some guy named Randy Clark started this quite a while ago. That's 4400 for their class if you want to take that. Um, we ran into the, uh, <clears throat> the one on the left called the TRL, the Last Reformation. You guys remember the conversations that might have been had here in the church where we had one family that decided to leave the church to go follow this guy named uh, Torben Sondergaard to Florida to basically um, learn how to do what this guy was doing, talking in tongues, healing people, prophesying over people. He runs a thing called the Pioneer Training, and that costs somewhere around four grand as well to take that, to learn how to do all those things. Okay. Well, here's some background on this uh, Torben Sondergaard guy. Uh, we already knew this. Uh, he was thrown out of Denmark for breaking the law there. They were going to throw him in jail, and he got wind of it, and he, he uh, came to the United States to seek asylum. Well, in 2022, I think it was 2022, yeah. In 2022, he was arrested on suspicion of gun smuggling and overstaying his visa. He was put in jail for a year. He was released in August of 2023 and, and deported back to Denmark. And in Denmark, they have this thing called um, passport swapping or whatever the deal is. But he didn't have to actually go into Denmark. Once he got it off the plane in Denmark, he got on another plane and went somewhere else. And, uh, and he's, you know, so he can't be in Denmark and he can't be in the United States. And people were following him. See, when you get caught up following a person instead of following the word of God, you run into these traps. You run into this nonsense. In 1 Corinthians 12, it says, All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Um, Jim alluded to that this morning. The spirit distributes the gifts as he determines. No one can teach you. No one can impart them on you. Nobody can do anything. If the Holy Spirit wants to give you a gift that he thinks needs to be utilized, he'll give it to you. And if you get it, you should use it. You should use it, right? Because he has a plan for it. But I can't go to a school and pay somebody money to get it. We learned about that in Acts 8 when this guy Simon the Sorcerer was running around watching the Holy Spirit being imparted on people. And he says in, in verse 20, he says, uh, it says, give me this ability also so that everyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter responds to him, Acts 8, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You thought you could buy the gift of God with money. That's a simple message here. I'm going to go to the BSSM Supernatural. Shame on you. You think you can buy the gift of God with money? No, you can't. How about just studying your Bible? And then you would have figured out, I can't buy the gift of God. It's either given to me or it's not. Second Peter 2 also says, In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. Talking about the false teachers that are coming. Prophesying against these false teachers. They'll make up clever lies. You can have the headbutt of the Holy Spirit. 
And of course, Christ warned us about all this already in Matthew 24. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. I'm going, he's going to try to deceive, if possible, even the elect, which kind of makes me believe the elect don't fall for this nonsense. Only the non-elect fall for the nonsense. Try that one on for size. Yeah, but they've got 1,000 people and 40,000 people, and they've got all these people. Yeah, non-elect. Non-elect. Because if you're deceived, then you are not the elect. Is that what he's saying here? Because he says, if possible, even the elect. So it's kind of like the elect should know better. That's kind of what he's saying. All right. And one of the other crazy people will not put up with sound doctrine, the whole idea of the sinner's prayer, the whole idea of praying Jesus into your heart, the whole idea of just saying these words and you're, you're okay forever. It has its roots back to 1730 uh, when it was originally called the mourner's seat. So basically, a preacher would get up and if you felt you were in sin, you would sit in the morning seat and they would basically preach to you and then they would take you aside and talk to you. It, be, it got popularized by Billy Graham in the 1950s. And we talked about this quite a while ago. But Billy Graham originally was following the mourner's seat deal, meaning he would basically say if anyone wants to choose Christ, if anyone wants to commit to Christ, then he would gather them and bring them into the back of the tent where he would have other, other um, pastors and spiritual people. And they would talk to you about your understanding of Christ, your understanding of the scripture, what do you believe, and if you believed and uh, <clears throat> wanted to be baptized, then they would baptize you there. The problem was he was getting too many people at his meetings, and it was taking up way too much time to get people into the water. He basically decided, well, we're going to just start this whole sinner's prayer. Just say the prayer in your seats, and we're all good. Baptism went away. It wasn't even part of his message anymore. Let's look at a couple things about that. John 14, Jesus says this himself. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. So what is one of the first things a believer who has decided to basically um, choose Christ as his Savior, what does he got to do? He'll keep his word. Well, in order to keep his word, he's kind of got to know what the word is. I got to know what everything is about before I can claim I keep it. So does that mean I can show up in one meeting and get it all done? Maybe. But in reality, is that how fast you learn about anything? No. Most of the time, we have to take some time to actually learn what we're doing. And Jesus says, if they love me, they will keep his word. In Acts 2, the very first story of conversion in the Bible, it says this, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and asked Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? So whatever they heard did what? Cut them to the heart. Cut them. They, they, they basically were broken based on the information that they were given and understood. They were broken. And what was their response? when you're broken. Well, then what should we do? And Peter got up and said, pray this prayer, and you'll be all set. No, he didn't. What he said was, repent and be baptized. What does repent mean? Turn away. Turn away from what? Sin. I'm going to turn away from my sin. I'm going to stop sinning, folks. Let's be as simple as we can be. I am going to stop sinning because of the message that I just heard that broke me to the core. I'm going to stop sinning before, because of it. Is that what you get when you get the sinner's prayer? <coughs> Not likely. And then what's the next step? And be baptized. Now again, the anti-water baptism folks get, oh, it's the Holy Spirit baptism. Blah, 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 blah. That's not true. That's not true. The only baptism they all understood at that point in time was John's baptism, the baptism of water, because that was a Jewish tradition, the whole idea of, of, of water. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, 
and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So according to Peter, in the very first conversion story, what things have to take place for a person to come to Christ? Well, one, they got to hear a message. Two, it's got to cut them to the heart. And three, they got to want to know what to do next. They ask, what do I do? We don't tell them what to do. We don't sit there and go, well, if you believe this, then do this. No, no, no. They're cut, and they can't live in their situation they're in, and they want to change. What do I do next? And the thing, first thing it says, you've got to turn away from your sin and be baptized. Those are the key elements of conversion. If I don't get cut to the heart, if I don't really believe the message, I have an emotional experience. And, and that's what happened. See, when they started doing this whole sinner's prayer thing, it was, it was a, a production. Even in the modern churches, it's a production. We come in and we sing all these songs. They get you going. They get you going. And then I get a message that gets me in this room. And then by the time I get done with the message, I'm emotionally like, I'm in. I'm emotionally in. But I'm emotionally into what? What am I making a decision for? Who am I making a decision for? Acts 8. Let's look at another conversion story. It says, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, who is the prophet talking about? So that we all know the story, right? The Holy Spirit says to Philip, I want to put you over there. I want you to talk to this eunuch. He was a very important guy, and he was from Ethiopia. And he shows up running next to the guy's carriage. And he's like, what are you reading? Well, I'm reading the Old Testament scrolls. Well, do you understand what you're reading? No, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> well, let me explain it to you. And so this is where that conversation comes from. The eunuch asked Philip, please tell me, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, and this is critical, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in my way of being baptized? It wasn't as they traveled along the road, and Philip said, look, there's some water. Let me baptize you. That wasn't the conversion. The conversion was the eunuch heard the message. It changed him. He understood the message because he said, there is water. What can stop me from being baptized? He is proactively seeking Jesus. Proactively seeking. You know, I've heard people when, they, when they're trying to do the whole sinner's prayer thing, they'd even say things like, well, if you don't even know what to say, just repeat after me. If you don't even, if you don't even believe, it's okay. I'll believe for you. That's not conversion. That's not conversion. And that's why there's so many Christians in churches that are doing all of these false, you know, um, false teaching and, and false gifts and all this stuff. That's why they're there and they're following along because they were never converted in the begin with. Oh, you can't say that. I just did. They were never converted in the begin with. Their conversion is not the way it was done. There's, why are we changing the Bible? Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You confess with your mouth. I don't confess for you. I don't pray for you. I do nothing. You have come to that conclusion on your own. And when you come to that conclusion on your own, God gives you the gift of faith. You have no other option to profess that Jesus is Lord. You are filled by the Holy Spirit, and you are grateful. It says when the, when the eunuch rose from the water, he jumped and praised God with joy, and Philip just disappeared. <laughs> Philip was, uh, the Holy Spirit's like, I, I got to go with you somewhere over there. Right? He didn't even miss him. Why? Because he was already focused on his Lord and Savior. So, we don't do the sinner's prayer here. Um, I, I know many of you may have participated in or even been converted by it. I'm not saying you can't ever get converted by that, but that's not the methodology that was laid out in the Bible. Again, if you're going to follow something, it has to match the Bible. There is nothing in the Bible that talks about a sinner's prayer. Nothing. The only thing they, that they'll put their hang their hat on it comes out of Revelation 3. And it's where it says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write these words. To the words, uh, 
to the, uh, the words of the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. So the only thing they focus on is, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. In such a way that if you just pray, it's okay because you're opening the door. It's not what this is about, especially when you take into consideration what he already started talking about. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Repentance doesn't leave the equation. Your involvement never leaves the, the equation. It's not this simple get out of jail for free card. It doesn't. Because once you accept Jesus as Lord, now i got to obey him. Now i got to walk with him. Now I've got to become less and he becomes more. You got the whole idea? There's nothing like that in, 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 in this pray Jesus in your heart thing. So I would encourage you guys to stay away from that. All right. He goes on after all of that. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He closes, gets very close to closing. I'm going to end there because I, there's some things he talks about next I want to go over a little bit. But he says, keep your head in all situations. Endure the hardships. Well, no, Christians shouldn't have hardships. Come on, right? We were all beyond that now, right? We all get the message. Endure the hardships. Do the work of the evangelist. Discharge all your duties in your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. So he knows his death is near. He knows that his time on the earth is coming to a, a close. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That has got to be our thoughts at the end of our road. When you look at your life, did you fight the good fight? Did you keep the faith? Have you finished the race? Or did you take some shortcuts? Or you're in a shortcut right now. That's a critical piece. If I've got anything to encourage you on, reflect on those, on that sentence. Daily, I'm fighting the good fight, I'm running the race, I'm keeping the faith. If you do that, you're going to make it to the end. And you'll meet your Lord and Savior, and they'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. If you don't do that, there's no fooling God. Remember, it says God cannot be mocked. There's no fooling him. If that is not your, your lifestyle, if that's not what your heart is, you are not going to make it. Amen? All right. Father, we thank you.